Real Physics. This interview is with David Spurge, a well-known theoretical astrophysicist and cosmologist. He's uh, a kind of evangelist of the standard model of cosmology and uh, praises how beautifully it describes the data. I think he considerably struggles in explaining how concepts like inflation meet the experimental evidence but first of all I think it's a document of how much modern science has changed since the time of Einstein. Listen to yourself. Um, you mentioned that um, the current cosmological model has a couple of parameters. Martin Rees wrote a book entitled uh, Just Six Numbers. Mm -hmm. Um, do you think that this model describes properly cosmology? It's been surprising how such a model, in some ways such a simple model, with, such, with a handful of numbers, the density of atoms, the density of matter, the age of the universe, how lumpy the universe is and how that varies with scale, together with something that parameterizes when the first stars form, because that affects mm -hmm. what we see, describes everything we see in the microwave background, now with Planck, tens of millions of independent observations. Uh, observations, a large-scale distribution of galaxies, the mm -hmm. statistical properties of millions of galaxies, mm -hmm. the distances we infer from supernovae, mm -hmm. the uh, uh, patterns we see in uh, uh, gravitational lensing, all the pieces fit these same basic numbers. Mm -hmm. And uh, okay. you know, this suggests that we're at least close to a model that's a good description of the universe on its largest scales. Mm -hmm. Do you think that uh, these are six numbers, or could it be that further observations force us to, to postulate a seventh or eighth number? Or? Uh, absolutely. In fact, this yeah. is one of the things we are trying to do with our observations. Look for the new physics. Look for mm -hmm. something. Um, either things that are telling us about initial conditions in the early universe, mm -hmm. that they were more complex than what we need to characterize these numbers, the fluctuations had more peaks and valleys, for example. Mm -hmm. um, so, so new numbers could could occur, could appear? New, could have, absolutely. Yeah. This is actually what we look for. From a philosophical point of view, is, is there any a maximum, num a maximum number of these numbers you would say is, is still satisfying? Or so, is, is it just open-end? And so that, that's um, nature. You know, nature tends to be simple, but not as simple as uh, it could be. So, the, the good example is the standard model of particle physics, which has been remarkably well tested at the great accelerators. It has typically 17 parameters. Mm -hmm. Now, all we need for life that we see is electrons and the up and down quark. We just need one generation of particles. Yet, nature comes with three generations of particles. And, you know, I, I don't remember who it was, but one of the famous early physicists, early 20th century physicists, when they discovered the muon, said, who ordered this? Yeah, no. it was Isaac Rabi, yeah. It, it was, it was a Rabi, yeah. okay, yeah, yeah. So, you know, and Rabi basically says, you know, why, do we, why doesn't nature just have the simplest model? Yeah, exactly. And then you have to add lots of additional parameters. Mm -hmm. So, in some ways, one could look at cosmology and ask the same thing, right? Yeah. Yeah. Nature could have just had atom, you know, uh, baryons, electrons and protons. Mm -hmm. Yet we have a universe with dark matter mm -hmm. and dark energy. Mm -hmm. There could be a simpler universe with fewer parameters. Mm -hmm. So is it, do you think it's worthwhile to, to, to ponder these questions, to wonder about the origin? And Einstein, uh, since we, we are dealing with him at this conference, Einstein in, in 1945 had an interesting um, exchange of letters with a philosopher named Ilse Rosenthal Schneider. Mm -hmm. And he said that um, he, arbitrary numbers that could have been chosen by the creator, so he said, uh, in just another way, are not satisfactory for him. He wanted to know the origin of these numbers. Do you think this is kind of outdated, or is no. it a leg legitimate question? No, no, not at all. No, I mean, I think these six basic numbers we have are uh, telling us about deeper physics. So, for example, the, the amount of atoms in the universe mm -hmm. is determined as a measure 
of the asymmetry between matter and antimatter. Mm -hmm. And we think that the amplitude of that asymmetry is an outcome of a much deeper theory mm -hmm. involving CP violation. It's a, in a sense a measured value. And we'd like to know that deeper theory. Mm -hmm. When we measure the, uh, how the fluctuations vary with scale, mm -hmm. um, that's telling us in the context of the inflationary model about the physics of inflation, what the ex how the expansion rate of the universe in its very early moments was varying as a function of time. So these are, are not, we think, arbitrary numbers, but uh, measurements of outcomes of deeper physics. And what is, um, to, yeah, so you know, I, I think all of this is telling us about physics beyond the standard model that we know and it motivates us to go, go deeper to the next level and understand what, the, the, what we're seeing. As to the experimental evidence for inflation, um, we have this um, cosmic microwave background which dates back to 380,000 mm -hmm. uh, years after the Big Bang. Uh, and this is the data we have, actually. So, um, if you think about the timescales of inflation, which is 10 to the minus 35 mm -hmm. seconds after the Big Bang, isn't it, um, well, audacious to put it mildly, to extrapolate uh, our 40 or 50 orders of magnitude and say there is evidence well, uh, for a certain model? I th the reason why we can do that, or at least it, consistent with predictions might be a more precise way to say, is that if, um, the, when we look at two different points in the sky, that are widely separated in the microwave background. If standard theory, and by standard theory I mean a universe without inflation, one that's just filled with radiation and matter, in that model, in the context of the Big Bang theory, those two points in the sky have never had time to communicate. It's an anomaly. Yes. It's, a, it's an anomaly. An yeah, it's a, problem. you know, it's a, how do you get these large scale fluctuations? So it requires a period of accelerated expansion. It requires that things move apart so quickly that those two parts of the sky were once in causal contact. So that's what requires something that looks a lot like inflation. Now, our observations don't tell us whether inflation happened at 10 to the minus 30 seconds or 10 to the minus 10 seconds. We don't know when inflation occurred. That um, uh, all that. Well, what we, I think, where I feel most confident as we go back in time, is we could look at the abundance of uh, deuterium produced in Big Bang nucleosynthesis. That's another point of evidence. Right, and that is a measurement that takes place a couple minutes after the Big Bang, and the physics really, it's the physics that starts sort of a second or so it's after the Big Bang. Lines. Actually, the, the and you see those in quasar yeah. lines, and you measure the deuterium abundance, um, and that depends on the density of atoms. We measure the density of atoms in the microwave background, we get a consistent measurements. Mm -hmm. So I think that consistency gives us confidence going back to a second. Mm -hmm. And then what gives us some confidence going further back is when you, you're looking at, say, 10 to the minus 6 seconds after the Big Bang. That's very early. But the energies involved there are still energies that are probed at accelerators like the Large Hadron Collider. So we think, so what we end up doing is saying, let's assume the physics we see in today's universe, in our laboratories, is the same, has not changed with time. Mm -hmm. And with that, we have the confidence to calculate what happens then. Mm -hmm. So I feel that we're making the leap, albeit a big one, from maybe 10 to the minus 6 seconds back to, you know, 10 to the minus 20 or 10 to the minus you 30 seconds. Are you sure about 10 to the minus 6 seconds? You would be rather sure. Yes. I would, uh, I feel we're on firmer ground. Mm -hmm. We can always discover new physics. There's certainly things we don't understand. Um, one of the things that we, you know, um, certainly one of the things I've done often in my career is you go and you say, let's imagine some new physics. Mm -hmm. Let's think about its implications. Let's look for its observational implications. Do we see it? And the fact that we have only six parameters is a, is a way of saying we've looked for lots of new physics. So far we haven't found it. That doesn't mean we won't find it in the future. Of 
final remark, uh, looking at the history of cosmology, which has had many overturns and revolutions, do you think that we almost got the final picture, or do you think, well, just an overturn of existing um, convictions could, could happen again? I think we have a more complete picture. By that, you know, so there's things about, say, our solar system that Newtonian physics does a good job of describing how planets are in the sun. That's mostly right. General relativity corrects things. It gives us a, con a different conceptual way of understanding it. But in terms of computing the orbits of Earth and Venus, it's a pretty small correction. Mm -hmm. We were, yeah. you know, Newton was pretty close to right. Right now, we can look at what we see in the microwave sky and predict what galaxy properties look like uh, 13 billion years later. And I think that, at the level of Newtonian physics being the right description of gravity, mm -hmm. that will probably stay the same. Okay. So I suspect that in 200 years, people will still talk the same way about how structure grows and how we can describe the properties of fluctuations. On the other hand, I suspect the way we talk about things like dark energy will seem incredibly naive. That probably there's some deeper physics that won't so much change the predictions that we are measuring today, but will provide a conceptual framework for understanding, the same way general relativity provides a, just a much deeper conceptual framework for understanding, that we'll have at the time. But who knows? Okay. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Oh, my pleasure.